I was staying at a West End in Atlanta. I stay at hotels a lot, and I generally think of them as being safe places. On the day of this event, I was terribly hungover, so hungover that I could barely get out of bed. But I had a hair appointment that I had already made a 50% deposit on, so I essentially had to pull myself together. I threw up several times before I got there. However, I eventually made it. Afterwards, I threw up on the way back. It was that bad. When I made it back to the hotel, it was between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. It wasn't even nightfall. I got on the elevator to go up to my room, and it was packed with people. I was visibly sick, sweating, and trying to prevent myself from throwing up in a crowded elevator. I could not hold it in long enough to make it to my floor, so I got off at the first chance. I was on my knees puking in a trash can by the elevator before the doors even opened. While puking, I noticed a man hovering behind me. He was well dressed and about 45 to 50. Out of embarrassment, I apologized for throwing up in public between heaves. He said, I saw you on the elevator, but I didn't realize we were on the same floor. Still puking, I informed him that I wasn't on this floor. He told me he was going to get me some help. Attempting to decline his offer, he just grabbed me by the elbow pulled me from the ground and started quickly dragging me down the hall. I was really out of it and didn't understand what was happening. By then, we were nearly halfway down the hall. I quickly realized that housekeeping had gone home for the day. There was no staff or patrons on the floor that I could see. I started getting really loud and he stopped dragging me. Still, he didn't release me so I kind of had to wiggle away. I ran back to the elevator and got on. Just before the doors closed, he put his arm in and boarded the elevator with me. I pressed the button to my floor and he got off with me. My room was at the end of the hall. I quickly walked back to my room, got the key to open my door, and tried to close it only to find that his foot was blocking me from doing so. A small struggle that lasted about eight seconds ensued. I eventually was able to close the door and put the security latch on it. Then I slid to the floor and started crying. Who was this man? Why was he doing this? If he wanted to help me, then why didn't he? What was he trying to do? I don't know, but I certainly hope that we never meet again. This story extends from 8th grade middle school to my freshman year in college. I'm 24 years old now, so this must have began in 2008. I was raised in a Korean household with strong Christian beliefs. Every summer and winter, there would be a youth retreat where all of the teens in our church would go to one big joint retreat with counselors and teenagers from churches in and out of the state. I met my best friend, Hannah, there. She was from Philly and had a pastor who was white, who we called Pastor Allen. After these retreats, everyone would add each other on Facebook and keep in touch. I remember a day or two after the 08 summer retreat, Pastor Allen would often reach out and ask how my talk with God was going since the retreat and if I ever need someone to speak to, I could always confide in him. This didn't alarm me at the time because counselors would keep in touch all the time. I always kept our conversations brief considering the fact I was shy and timid over the years, I had seen Pastor Allen at retreats 
and was friendly with him, nothing strange happened other than his persistence with keeping in touch with me on Facebook after retreats. I slowly stopped talking to him, and eventually, we didn't speak at all. This is where it all starts to get weird. One day, after our summer retreat in 2011, I got a friend request from a woman named Sumiko. I noticed we had a lot of mutual friends from the retreat, so I assumed she was a counselor there. She messaged me immediately after I accepted the request. Her and I became quickly acquainted. At the time, I was 15, and she was everything I needed in an older sister. Although we never met, I let my naivety get the best of me and confided in her about my teenage girl troubles. After a month's end, I remember walking into church and asking one of my youth leaders if they had met her at the retreat. He said he had never heard of her. I asked him if he could go check the roster and he did only to find out there was no Sumiko on the list. That's when things started to get super eerie for me. I panicked and went home to block Sumiko off of my Facebook. I saw on her page that the only person who continued to tell her it was nice seeing her was Pastor Allen. No one else from the retreat seemed to really be interacting with her. It all started to freak me out. I blocked her and unfriended Pastor Allen. I remember no longer attending these church retreats. A few days later, I received an email telling me that Sumiko decided to attempt suicide because of me and that the email was coming from the mental hospital she was staying at. They told me it was all my fault. I was a junior in high school under high amounts of stress from SATs and I deleted the email because I just wanted to forget about it all and focus on studying. Shortly after, I started to receive really unfriendly anonymous messages on my Tumblr. They would tell me that I was going to burn in hell for eternity if I continued to stray from God. They continued all the way into my senior year in high school. I always deleted and ignored them, or I'd reply sarcastically and laugh at them with my friends. Eventually, the messages faded and I didn't hear much from them anymore. In 2012, I got accepted to a close-by Christian college and moved into my dorm. My dorm floor decided to have a little icebreaker meeting to help us get comfortable. I met another Korean girl and began talking about our similarities in our childhood being raised Korean with Christian parents. I opened up to her about the encounter with Pastor Allen and midway through the story, I saw her face slowly dropping and getting pale. She told me she had a very similar encounter with a pastor she knew and that he was also a white man working with the youth in an all-Korean church. I asked her where she was from and she replied with the same state that Pastor Allen was from. She then asked me if the name of the pastor was Pastor Allen. We had the same predator in our lives at the same age. I'm not sure where Pastor Allen is now, but I pray to God that he has not harmed any little Korean girls. It's absolutely disgusting. He was borderline 60 years old when I was 14 or 15. It makes me sick knowing people prey on children in the most vulnerable ways. It ruined a lot about my perspective on Christianity as well. It's horrible to take something so spiritual and take advantage of a child with it. So Pastor Allen, with a creepy young Asian girl fetish, let's never ever meet again. There is a girl that has been stalking and harassing me since October 2018. We were in the same class in high school six years ago. She was super shy, never spoke in class, 
and barely had any friends. I can't remember speaking to her more than once or twice through all of high school. To me, she did not even exist. Then, all of a sudden, many months ago, I woke up to a message in my Facebook inbox that read, Fuck white people. She is Asian. From what country, I do not know. I thought this was really strange. So I tried to reply back, what's going on? But she had blocked my messages. I decided to just ignore it and go on with my life. About a month had passed, and I woke up to yet another message in my inbox. She had sent me a screenshot of an Instagram account in my name. No posts or followers, just an empty account with my name. I kind of freaked out a little and tried to reply, but yet again she had blocked my messages. I tried to find the account on Instagram, but could not. My name is very uncommon, so the possibilities that this was another guy's account was very slim. It certainly wasn't my account. I was very confused and kind of scared that she had created an account with my name and would post things pretending to be me. I contacted one of her high school friends and asked if she could deliver a message for me since I had no way of reaching her. To my surprise, they weren't friends anymore and hadn't spoken in months. I told my closest friends about what had been happening. They told me that they received some strange messages too. I was seriously confused by this point. This one girl nobody talked to or had any kind of relationship with was sending pictures on Instagram accounts, weird memes, and three word sentences that made zero sense to me and many of my friends. I tried to think of why she did this. Had we treated her badly at some point, but I could not think of anything that we had done. I remember giving her a piece of gum one day, but that is about as close to any communication that happened between us. I decided I would just try to ignore her and hope she would not send me any more messages. But then, around Christmas time, I woke up to my Facebook exploding with notifications and messages. I think I had around a good hundred plus notifications. She had been sharing all of my profile pictures and posts. I am seriously freaking out at this point. And open messenger. I have received 56 messages that all read, kill yourself. I tried to message her again, but surprise, surprise, she had blocked my messages. I was becoming really angry at this point. I clicked on her Facebook profile to block her and get rid of her for good. Before I went to block her, I scrolled down her wall, and she had been sharing literally hundreds of posts and pictures of me. My friends and some other people, I had no idea who they were. I did some detective work and found her sister's Facebook profile and decided to send her a message. I took screenshots of everything she had done and sent it to her, asking why she was doing this. She freaked out when she saw what her crazy stalker sister had done. The stalker had deleted her sister on Facebook because of an argument they had around October when this all started. So she hadn't seen anything she had done. She promised me she would talk to her crazy stalker sister and make her stop. I received a message from the sister a few hours later that she had talked to the stalker and promised she would stop and she apologized. I was so happy this finally would be over and thanked her. Another few months passes. We are now in February 2019. I hadn't received any messages since I talked to her sister, and I had honestly forgot about everything that had happened. Two days ago, I was playing some games with my friends on my PC talking on Discord. My phone was on the table, and I saw it lit up once. I had received a notification. I wouldn't bother to check it before the game was done. 
a few seconds after, I get another one, and another one. I could see my phone in the corner of my eye. Notifications came swarming in. Then I remembered the crazy stalker girl, and got a really awful feeling in my stomach. Praying this wasn't her again, I stopped playing and picked up the phone. Notifications still swarming in. The stalker was sharing my pictures and posts yet again. And all had a caption like, Kill yourself, or I hope you die. I instantly blocked her. A few minutes later, it happened again. Someone with another username was sharing my pictures. I blocked the account instantly. She had created at least 10 accounts, and I was desperately blocking all of them as fast as I could as soon as I saw a notification. I sent her sister a message again and told her I was going to report this to the police if she wouldn't stop. She told me she would talk to her. Angry, confused, and kinda scared, I went back to the gaming session, talking to my friends about it. I went to sleep a few hours later. I woke up late the next day. It was hard to sleep after thinking about all that was happening. My cousin had received some messages from my crazy stalker. She had told him that I owed her money. I kept my calm and told him about everything and said that he should just go with it. I wanted to see where this was going. She thought my cousin was my father. He was a lot older than me, so I could see why she would think that. They had a long conversation where she claimed that I had both stolen and hacked her phone and lent money from her. And that I was the reason she lost her scholarship and had to move. She said I owed her 10k, which later became 50k. And then again, she raised the amount to 100k later in the conversation. All of this is, of course, a crazy lie. I'm so confused of why she is doing this to me. I have no idea what I have done to her. And I'm going to report this to the police tomorrow. I'm really fucking scared of what she might accuse me of next. Or if she is going to show up on my doorstep one day. All of this happening six years after the last time I saw her. So I just came back home after talking with the police. They told me I had a strong case and could press charges if I wanted to. I decided not to do it for now. I don't want to make it harder than it has to be. I will give her one last chance to stop. They will call her today and tell her to stop or face charges. Any further contact with me or my family will cause her to see consequences. Either way, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get her a restraining order if she doesn't comply. I would also like to add that I do not think she is a violent person and she has never threatened my life directly, nor have I ever feared for my life. This plays a huge part of why I did not press charges. I firmly believe that something terrible has happened to her within the last year and that she is really sick and in need of help. Her family know about the situation and it's up to them or the authorities to make sure she gets help if she needs it. What bothered me the most about this whole situation was the false accusations and not the sharing of pictures and messages itself. I am happy with my decision and I hope I have made the right call. My sister had been dating this guy for three years. She told me that in 8th grade he stalked her. Just staring at her in the halls and asking about her schedule. I met him about a week after she told me this story. He seemed nice at the time. We talked a bit and then he asked me if I wanted to play Call of Duty. We played for about an hour and had some laughs. I didn't find anything off-putting. 
He seemed to be a generally nice guy. However, that was three years ago, and these past years, he has been getting weirder and weirder. And more obsessive. As in, he would constantly call my sister to ask what she was doing, and filled her fun with hundreds of texts when she didn't reply immediately. They had multiple breakups and arguments over these years. Just a few days ago, my sister's friend came to us hysterical, stating that he had threatened her life. But they are still together to this day. She also stated he probably had bugged my sister's car and phone because he knows all the texts she has sent and showed up at her house when my sister's car was parked in the driveway. He did not even know where she lived. I am convinced too that her car is being traced. He even managed to track us down when we were with my grandparents on vacation. This all changed about two days before our vacation to California. I'm one of those people who stay up really late at night, even though it's a school day the next morning. I usually just binge watch videos on my computer while laying in bed. It was about 12 midnight on Saturday when I heard a faint screech. The sound sounded vague and distant. Then I heard a soft sound on my garage door opening. I assumed it was my sister coming home late, like my dad predicted. He left the garage door unlocked because he expected her to come home late. I heard smooth and soft footsteps walking up the wooden stairs, and then a shallow grunt. The footsteps slowly moved throughout the upstairs while I paused my video and sat up in fear. My sister would usually not care about being so quiet and went straight to the bathroom to take off her makeup. The soft footsteps ensued. I would now like to mention that I do have a lock on my door. I convinced my dad to get me one two years ago because I am paranoid about someone attacking me by simply opening the unlocked door. I could hear the floorboards creak as the footsteps neared my door. I heard a hand graze the frame of my door and grasp the knob tightly. I held my breath and my hand started to reach towards the wooden baseball bat I had under my bed. The doorknob turned slightly, but the lock restricted it from turning all the way. The intruder on the other side jiggled it a bit and seized. I grabbed my baseball bat and gradually made my way towards my door. I saw two gray shoes inches away from my door. I raised my bat defensively, ready to whack whoever picked the lock or busted down my door. The shoes slowly turned and strided away from my door. My sister's door opened and a few moments later, I heard footsteps exiting and steadily walked down the creaking and protesting stairs. I dropped my bat to my waist and walked back to my bed. I pulled a chair to barricade my door just in case and breathed silently to calm down. My phone was out of battery, so I couldn't call the police and my mom and dad were on the other side of the house. I would make a mad dash for my parents' room, or I could just scream at the top of my lungs and hope that they wake up before the intruder gets to me. It may also scare him off by me alerting my parents. So I screamed. About a minute later, I heard heavy footsteps rushing over and unlocking my door. My dad opened the door my dad opened the door with a look of complete concern and dread. He asked me if I was okay and I told him there was someone in the house. He grabbed my bat and hurried downstairs. 
He came back up a few minutes later after checking all the closets and general hiding places. He ordered me to go back to bed and lock my door. I was wide awake for half an hour, but eventually somehow dozed off. I woke up to find my dad talking to my mom in the hallway. He told me the garage was pried open with some kind of rusty tool or crowbar. The intruder had left a note in my sister's room saying he didn't know where she was and that he missed her. I knew immediately that it was her boyfriend. What disturbed me the most was when I looked at my phone. It had a new message. I had wrote a message to a number I have never seen before. Late at night, the only problem was I hadn't texted anyone last night, and there was a response. It read, Merry Christmas. There's one problem with this. I haven't sent a message to anyone with this number in my life. And my phone, it was in my room last night. This happened years ago, but still affects me to this day. The summer after I graduated high school, I was still living at home. I was up late one night and was packing for a camping trip with my friends. It was unbelievably hot and had the window open as I sat in folded clothes. It was around 2 in the morning and the next thing I knew, there was a hand coming through the gap in the screen of my window. I screamed, and the hand flew back. I was stunned, but there was a part of me that wondered if it was my younger brother pranking me. I got up and looked out the window, and just saw the figure of a man staring back at me. I ran into my brother's room and he was there playing video games. We called the police, who came and searched the area. They found nothing, warned me and my parents to lock the windows and doors, and left. We were all still shaking up, and my mom had a feeling that he would come back. It turns out our mother's intuition was right. She went outside and waited on our back porch, after 20 minutes or so, she saw a man, dressed in black, slink into the backyard along the tree line. He hid behind a tree for a few seconds and ran to the other tree and hid there, slowly working his way toward my window. My mother yelled something to him, and he took off running. The police came back out and again found no trace of him. I opened the window again, not even the curtains. My parents installed some motion detecting lights, and that seemed to be the end of that. About six months later, my friend and I got an apartment downtown together. We were really excited. This was our first place on our own. The apartment wasn't exactly the best quality, but it was so fun to be living in the city. The downside was that it was street parking only. After a few weeks, my car was broken into. Nothing was taken but a single rose sat on the passenger seat. It was creepy, but I vowed to be vigilant and safe. I always tried to park close to the entrance near the lights. But often it was difficult to get those spots, and I would often have to park further away on darker streets. Things quickly began escalating at this point. My car was broken into at least once a week. Most of the time a flower was left, but once a pair of men's underwear was left. And even more creepily, once a bag of Tootsie Rolls, as they were my favorite candy. This made me wonder if the person knew me personally, and I started to become suspicious of everyone. There was laundry in the basement of the apartment, and one day I went down 
to get a load that finished drying. As I started to fold, I realized all of my undergarments, bras and panties were gone. Another week and I had a male friend over from high school and his tires got slashed during the visit. By the time the first letter arrived, I had already started making plans to move elsewhere. The letter described a love for me that had been going on for years. He noted things that proved he had been watching me closely. I was able to arrange for another friend to take over my lease and moved in with another friend on the other side of the city. It was a secure building and had an underground parking garage that was only accessible to tenants. I felt much more secure and the extra money spent was well worth the peace of mind. Things were quiet for a few months and then my roommate got a boyfriend. Most of us were weary of Ashley's new boyfriend from the beginning. For one, they met on MySpace after he reached out to her. Another reason was that new boyfriend, Matt, was extremely good looking. And while Ashley was a wonderful person, she just wasn't the type. She just wasn't the type you would typically expect someone like him to date. Ashley was thrilled. She had never had a boyfriend and really felt like he was a Prince Charming. I thought he was weird and creepy from the beginning. Matt was on the quiet side and always seemed to be sporting an uncomfortable, lingering smile. It was difficult to carry on any sort of conversation with him because he would always make it weird with some random facts that were completely unrelated to what we were talking about. I had deleted my MySpace when the initial stalking began, but I created the dummy account to learn more about Matt. It didn't look like he really knew any of his friends in real life. There was only pictures of himself and the rest of the information was vague. My friends and I gently tried to discourage her from seeing Matt. He technically hadn't done anything wrong, but he was just so strange. She would immediately get defensive and would shut the conversation down. Matt started to spend more time at the apartment, and I found myself finding any excuse I could to avoid coming home. One day, I came home from work and found Matt on my couch alone, drinking a beer. Ashley had been called into work and she told him he could just hang out. I was furious because I didn't want to spend any time with him, so I grabbed a beer and a snack and headed off to my room and shut the door. About 30 minutes or so, he knocked on my door and suggested we watch some TV and get to know each other better because we both loved Ashley. I didn't want to but decided that maybe I needed to give it a try. He put on a movie and I tried to just focus on the movie because I didn't want to talk. At one point I glanced over to Matt and he was staring at me with a smile on his face. I snapped a what at him and he just continued smiling and said, I just can't believe it. Believe what? I asked. He said nothing and went back to watching the movie still smiling. I had no idea what he was talking about, but the interaction had every hair standing up on my body. I excused myself and locked the door to my room. Another month or so went on and I had managed to avoid being home for much anything beyond sleep and showering. Matt practically lived there and had even brought a bunch of his things to Ashley's room. I really didn't want to move again, but was beginning to look for other options. On their six month anniversary, I saw a huge banquet of flowers on the table and an already opened card popped up next to it. I rolled my eyes and was about to leave when I decided to see what the weirdo wrote to her. When I opened the card, my heart started beating through my chest. 
the handwriting was exactly the same as the one my stalker had sent. I kept them as evidence and dug them out of my desk for comparison. The handwriting was unique and identical. Matt was the stalker. I called the police first. As they were on their way, I called Ashley and asked her to come over. She was at work but said she would be there when she could. I was terrified to tell her because I knew she would be shattered. The police took a statement from me and actually went to Ashley's work to get more information from her and they ended up breaking the news. Apparently Ashley called Matt and left a furious message even though the cops told her not to say anything and he completely disappeared after that. There was no Matt or anyone matching his resemblance at the place he said he worked. Ashley had never been to his apartment because he said he had been staying with friends while trying to save money for a trip to Europe. His family lived out of state. She had never met a friend of his because he said they had a falling out because he was choosing to spend so much time with Ashley. It was all lies, and in the end, she was dating a stranger. We don't even know if Matt was his real name. The cherry on top of all this whole thing was when we went through Matt's things. He had left everything when we disappeared, and Ashley and I decided to go through everything. There was a duffel bag that was full of gym clothes. But in one of the compartments, there were about ten pictures of me. All of them were taken from far away, with the exception of one of me sleeping. The sheets were current, so I know it had to have been at the current apartment. Before I started locking my bedroom door, a few pictures dated back to before the incident at my parents house which made us think that was him as well two pairs of my missing underwear were there and I shuddered to think what he did with the rest a Starbucks lid with my red lipstick marks a necklace I hadn't even noticed missing a few other random sick souvenirs the police never tracked him down. I decided to accept an opportunity overseas that I hadn't been considering and got the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Ashley and I quickly drifted apart. She had a really hard time accepting that her first love was a complete psycho. I think I had some underlying anger for believing all of his lies and letting him into our lives. I don't know what his end game was. Would he have tried to hurt me? Or was he simply content with being in my world? I'll never know. Being stalked changes you. Even when I lived across the world, I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. I still have no social media accounts attached to my real name. I am married with children and know that he moved on to torment some other poor woman. But every time I visit my hometown, I am tense and keep a low profile. Part of me will always worry that Matt will resurface again. I watched something on YouTube that reminded me of an episode in HS. I went to a regular school in my country where the classes ranges from grade 0 to grade 9. Pretty normal school. Low budget but still okay. Kids from middle class families as average as can get. It wasn't unusual for teachers to come and go. Our teacher had just quit so we needed a substitute teacher for a week till they could find us another. We were in grade 7. The bell rings and we all sit down. This tall, big, bald man 
in his 30s walks in. He looked super serious. We all thought he was lost. He sits down at the desk and says, You can call me sir. In a very serious, loud, and firm tone. We were all like, damn, dude, fine. We proceeded to grab our books. We all got a weird vibe from him, so no one dared to speak or do a sudden move. A girl raised her hand and asked, Sir, what's your name? A simple, innocent, and fair question. This man stormed to her desk and pushed her against the desk of the student behind her while he was still sitting. My name is irrelevant. Or something along those lines. She looked so mortified and as he was walking back to his desk and the girl was fixing herself and her seating, he said, I do not want any stupid questions in this classroom. My memory is a bit foggy as this was like 10 years ago but I recall him freaking out even more about other small things. But what sticks out to my memory the most is when this happened. This girl in our class got up and asked, Sir, can I have permission to close the window? This was in mid-December and there was a heavy and thick snow outside and she was sitting right by the window. The window the teacher opened. I guess she thought she saw a nod, so she proceeded to get up on the table by the window and grab out for the window. As she is doing this, the teacher storms over to her, literally pushes her out and closes the window. Luckily, we we're on the ground floor, but she was in her socks and not wearing any jacket. She falls down and got all wet and cold. A bunch of us got up to open the window to help her in, while others were screaming at him. But he pushed everyone away that wanted to let her in. So she had to run in her wet socks and generally wet clothes to the nearest entrance. When she got back in, he had a grin on his face and was like, Oh, come on, I was just playing. After class, me and a few others stormed right to the principal's office and reported the dude, but the teacher had gotten there before us. So when we went in, the teacher and the principal were laughing and bonding. So when we wanted to tell him what had happened, the teacher was like, Kids and their stories. And the principal just laughed at us. I never felt so fucking helpless. No one took us seriously. But this does have a happy ending. A few weeks later, we were all informed that he had got fired and he was banned from teaching kids. He was a former military dude that recently got home from being deported and needed something to do. He had a lot of serious issues that he never spoke about until they investigated our story. He had apparently been having deep anger issues and apparently attacked some people and almost harmed a child. The police got involved, I think. I hope I never ever meet him again, but I do hope that he got the help he needed to not be a threat to society. Now this happened probably about a year ago or so. My mom and I were still living together in this really populated city in Pennsylvania and really you can drive about less than five minutes away and hit a Walmart, 7-Eleven, Lowe's, three gas stations, etc. So really it wasn't out of the ordinary that my mom and I made a day of running errands to multiple places. We go to the local CVS waiting an abnormally long time for a prescription so we start talking about the next place we were going to go which was the closest pretzel factory so we finally get our prescription and head off to pick up some pretzels we get there and then talk about how we have to hit up the closest lows as well 
We get in the car and drive in that direction. After about three minutes, my mom nonchalantly says, That car has followed us from CVS to the pretzel factory and now is behind us driving oddly slow. I'm a little taken aback by this because I'm a young girl who doesn't have her license and walks everywhere due to that. I'm unusually extremely observant and also as an introvert I just pick up on these things. But this caught me completely off guard. I kind of just sit there for a second and say, Well, are you 100% sure? Yeah, my mom said. I saw this guy's car at the CVS and the pretzel factory, and now he is weirdly following behind us. Not so fast or close that we can see his face. Then my mom starts getting kind of angry at the same time. She looks at me and says, I'm going to go slow for a second and line up with his car. Get a good look at this guy. I'm pretty freaked out at this point and realize that we had had been kind of loud about where we were headed to, each time not seeing that it's possible why he appeared everywhere we were headed so far. So my mom suddenly slows down and we see this lanky balding creeper with big glasses. He sees us line up with him and starts freaking out in his car. He suddenly steps on the gas and tries to drive away from us. While I copy his license plate and the weird heart sticker on his bumper, my mom was definitely not having it and said, You know what? We are going to get behind him and follow him. So we start to follow this guy and somehow lose him in traffic. We debate whether or not to go home because... We are so close to our house, but since we lost him, we decide it may not be a good idea if he follows us there somehow, and then knows where we live now. So we park to the side and wait about 30 minutes. Then because we don't want to go home, decide to just go to Lowe's because the guy is probably gone by now. We pull up to Lowe's and see none other than that same car like two rows over from where we park. And now I definitely know this guy was listening in on where we were headed for the day because he didn't follow our car to Lowe's. He was already there when we arrived. This really disturbed my mom and I. We decided to get the fuck out and go home and not do anything for the rest of the day. I wrote down all of his car information in case I ever saw him again, but never did. At least not yet. But my fingers are crossed this guy learned his lesson. When he was stalked instead of the stalker, I always think, if I were alone that day and my mom wasn't looking out, who knows what could have happened, or how far this guy would have followed me or her to our house, to our work. Thinking about it still gives me goosebumps. Creepy guy who followed us to three places. Please, for the love of God, let's not meet ever again. Two thousand seventeen was a strange time. While working night audit at a motel, I experienced the strangest individual on a weekly basis. The motel office was a large detached building with mostly windows and a glass door. I had security cameras on the building with all the rooms and along the back side of my building. It was the middest of summer and I was working on some paperwork at about midnight. I peeked up at the furthest window in the room near the breakfast buffet and noticed someone quickly moved out of view. I got a vague glimpse of a white-haired man, but didn't notice anything on the security cameras. I swiftly locked the doors. A few months rolled by, and I hadn't experienced anything of that white-haired man again. It was soon August of 2017, late one night at about 1 a.m., an older man comes in. I thought perhaps he was a guest but he begins blabbering. Hello, my name is John. You probably already know me. 
I'm so sorry. I can't believe you saw me. I must have scared you so bad the other night. I looked at him puzzled. He was beginning to freak me out. So I asked, what are you talking about? He looked a bit surprised and explained a few nights ago, you were walking out to your car and I ran past you as well, naked. It's hard to explain. I was pretty creeped out at this point. I was pretty creeped out at this point. But I humored him and let him ramble on. But didn't say much. He explained that on the weekends he liked to run around town naked. As an adrenaline rush. He then said something that creeped me out more than ever. I notice you have been working here six months or so. Sorry I never said hello before. You work quite a lot compared to the other girl. This strange naked man has been watching me every weekend for six months and I never knew. Admittedly I wasn't always the most alert on my phone, on my laptop, taking a swift nap, but six months and I never noticed a naked man running through the parking lot. This began a routine of him coming back every weekend offering me gifts or as my friends called them bribes to not call the cops he would come in every weekend and talk to me before his nightly streaking and bring me expensive candy or wine it was strange how a little too expensive these gifts were but he was a single old man with a good job Soon rolled in October, just like any weekend he comes in and chats to me, grabs some coffee I usually made, and asks me about my week. He then explains he's going out for some drinks at a neighbor's house, and that he wanted to give me a, a bottle of champagne he had in his fridge. Being nice like I always tend to be, I agreed and thanked him. About two hours pass and I hear a tap on the window. It's him, but he's naked. I look up on the camera and no doubt about it, he's blatantly standing in front of the office naked. He keeps tapping the window and holds up the champagne for me to come get, but of course I'm very creeped out. He set it by the front door and waved. He thought he had left, so I walked out to grab it before a guest saw it laying there. But in fact, he did not leave. He stood there naked and trying to talk to me. I covered my eyes and said, Uh, thanks. I'm going inside now. The next night, he comes in and apologizes to me profusely, saying he had too much to drink. Him being so embarrassed, I never saw him again. After that, I wasn't sure if he was scared to talk to me because I didn't want to see him naked or if he got arrested for running around naked. Because I worked there for so long, I get free rooms anytime I come visit. So next time I come to that motel, strange man, let's not meet again. To give a little background information, this started in the winter of 2012. I was 23 years old at the time and living with my dad. My mom and my brother were living in another house about 10 minutes away from us. One morning I woke up around 8 a.m. because I had an early doctor's appointment and I went outside to see a note pinned to the windshield wiper of our car. The note said, I'm going to kill you, scum. I kind of just laughed it off. I assumed the note was for my dad, who had a habit of complaining to parents in our neighborhood about their children's shitty behavior. I thought one of the parents was just being a douchebag, so my dad and I didn't bother with it too much. Later in the day, while talking to my mom on the phone, I mentioned the note to her offhandedly in a very casual way, and I was shocked by her response. She responded by very emphatically warning me several times to make sure all of my windows and doors were locked and to bring a weapon to bed with me at night. 
I was a bit taken aback because she had never said anything like that to me before. She'd never even given me the good touch, bad touch talk. She reminded me that at least 12 times over the course of the conversation to bring a knife or a baseball bat to bed with me and to lock my bedroom door at night. I thought she was just overreacting, so I waved her off. Then other weird things started happening. We started getting random packages and deliveries sent to our house. Bibles and Korans, newspapers, porn flyers, pizzas, and moving trucks that we hadn't ordered. The first few times it happened I thought it was a mistake, but as it kept happening I came to the conclusion that somebody must have been pulling a prank on us. We didn't know who it was, so there was nothing that we could do about it, but apologized profusely to yet another confused pizza delivery man. In September of that year I started taking a night school class with my best friend. The course went from 6pm to 10pm every Monday and Wednesday night. And after the class, his mom would pick us up and drive us home. Sometime in November, his mom dropped me off from school and I went inside and chilled on the couch for a couple of hours. I ended up falling asleep on the couch. Something woke me up abruptly at about 4 in the morning. I heard the unmistakable sound of a car or tire being slashed and it sounded like our car. What the hell was going on? We didn't have any enemies. In retrospect, this was probably a stupid thing to do especially considering I'm a relatively small female, but I grabbed a kitchen knife and went outside to check it out. When I got outside, I discovered immediately that I was correct. There was a man in our driveway slashing our car tires. Unwisely, I immediately yelled, Hey, you! And he turned around to face me. That was when I noticed what he was slashing our tires with, an enormous hunting knife at least six inches long. He looked surprised, but then defiant, and began to advance towards me with the knife slightly raised. I just froze. I didn't know what to do. He was coming at me so fast I couldn't even think. Thankfully, at the exact second, my across-the-street neighbor, who had also heard him slashing our tires, turned on his porch light and yelled out the window, Hey, I'm calling the cops! The man yelled back, I don't give a damn! Call them! But he quickly retreated back to his car where I could see a middle-aged woman with long brown hair waiting for him in the passenger seat. Our eyes locked and I knew instantly that we had met before, but I couldn't quite put my finger on when or where. I just knew in my gut that I had met this woman before. They sped off into the night and we called the cops, who said they couldn't do anything for us because they didn't know who had done it. I called my mom to tell her what had happened, and if she had any idea who would have done this to us, she immediately said no, but there was something in her voice. I could just tell she wasn't being honest. A few weeks later, I decided to go to my mom's house to spend a day or two, determined to get some answers. As soon as I walked in the front door, I knew something was wrong. The second she saw me, she just started bawling her eyes out. She took me by the hand and sat me on the couch and explained the whole story to me, start to finish. It's necessary for me to give a little background information. Here, my mother is a businesswoman by trade. On the side of her regular day job, she was also selling Arbonne makeup, which is an all-natural brand of makeup that is free from parabens, oils, sulfates, and other common cosmetic additives. A couple of months before this all started, she had ended up being referred to a new client named Andre by her weed dealer. Andre was her dealer's girlfriend. It's not a girl's name, is it? Oh my god. Oh, whatever. And she was interested in buying Arbonne. So my mom invited her over to her apartment to look at some makeup samples. They started chatting about a bit of various topics. My mom let it slip that her last name was Hayes. As my mom told me, Andre had paused for a few seconds, looked at her, and then said, Hayes? Did you use to be married to a man named Darren Hayes? My mom answered that yes, Darren Hayes was her ex-husband. Then shockingly, this Andre woman had actually burst into tears, threw her arms around my mom in a hug, and, and begun to tell her this horrific story about all of the disgusting things that my dad had done to her. Apparently she was 14 years old, 
she had been dating a man named Andrew, who happened to be living with my dad at the time during my parents' divorce. According to Andre, these men, her boyfriend Andrew, Andrew's twin brother Daniel, and my father had taken turns beating her, assaulting her, and then forcing her to prostitute herself in order to make money off of her. Eventually, they ended up selling her into child prostitution, from which she said she never recovered. This is where I'd recognized her from. My dad had become roommates with her boyfriend, Andrew, and I used to see all three of them when I went over there to visit him every second weekend. She sobbed during the whole retelling of this story, telling my mother how after this traumatic experience, she had turned to drugs and alcohol to numb the pain of her abuse, and that she had been addicted to crack and alcohol off and on ever since because of what my father had done to her. My mom was shocked. She didn't know what to do. On the other hand, she knew my father to be a generous, soft-spoken, and kind person who had never lifted a finger to her or any other person, and who rarely raised his voice. But on the other hand, it seemed odd that Andre would just happen to remember his name all these years later if she had been lied. She didn't know who to believe. After several hours of crying and much consoling on my mother's part, Andre finally left. This was when the stalking began. A few days after this encounter, my mother came home from work to find Andre's boyfriend sitting on her couch waiting for her. He immediately told her, that he was planning on killing my dad, that my dad deserved to die because he was a pedo piece of shit, and that if my mom told anybody, anybody at all, especially the cops, that he would be sure to kill me as well. He then concluded his threat by describing the layout of our living room and exactly what outfit I was wearing that day. From then on, he and Andre would text or call her several times a day to threaten and taunt her, telling her that they were going to call the cops on my dad and have him thrown in prison, that they were going to have him killed, and that if she told anybody, they would hire someone to murder me. Naturally, my mother was absolutely terrified. She was from an upper middle class family who had immigrated to Canada from Germany. She had never dealt with this type of person before. She stopped eating, she couldn't sleep, and she even stopped going to work. She lost 30 pounds and her hair started falling out from stress. She started having panic attacks because she didn't know what to do. Eventually, after the night when I almost got stabbed, she decided that she had to call the cops. She couldn't take the chance that they would hurt me. She had to do something about it, and what she found out was shocking. Andre was well known to the police when my mom told them this story. She was so well known that they weren't even surprised to hear her story. In fact, they told her Andre had done this exact same thing to at least a dozen men. She would meet and blackmail men into giving her money, electronics, drugs, etc., threatening to call the cops and report them for assault if they didn't. Her boyfriend was a drug dealer, and as it turned out, would often use his drug connections to intimidate and extort the men, and for some reason, he never questioned her stories of being abused and enslaved by all of these different men. Then when Andre, who was a crack and heroin addict and a prostitute, would get arrested on a possession or drug distribution charge, she would attempt to make deals with the police by offering them information about men who were pedos in exchange for less time in prison. She eventually did this so many times that the police stopped believing in her. After my mom called the cops, the whole story came undone, and Andre and her boyfriend haven't bothered us since. But it's been over a year since the whole thing happened, and I'm still terrified to leave the curtains open at night time, in case somebody is watching me. I don't think I'll ever be able to feel fully safe in this house ever again. So Andre, let's not meet again, ever. A few years ago, I had to fully rely on public transportation to get around anywhere. I had to catch the bus at around 3.34 a.m. That was about three quarters of a mile from my house to get to work. The street I had to walk down was mostly residential, and what businesses were there were closed. Only dim street lights lit the road, so basically, so basically it was a quiet road. 
with no one around and dim lighting. A bit of info on me. I am a woman and was in my mid-twenties. Usually the walk went fine. I could get there fairly quickly. This particular morning, though, was not so fine. I got about halfway to the bus stop when I noticed a white car was parked across the street at a closed business. I couldn't tell how many people were in the car, or their gender or what, but it struck me as odd. I hoped that maybe it was a couple making out or something, but once I passed it, it turned out of the parking lot and drove past me. I did not like that, and I made sure to walk as far from the street as possible. He U-turned up ahead and slowly drove back the other way, until he could U-turn again, then drive past me once more. He parked in another lot across the street and waited for me to pass. At this point I'm freaked out because if he decided he wanted to snatch me up, there would have been no witnesses whatsoever. I got my phone out and dialed 911, but didn't place the call right away. But when he pulled out again to drive past me, I made the call. At this point I have 911 on the phone, and he finally pulls out and rolls his window down. I should note that I am generally a pushover in too mild manner for my own good. I usually let a man talk to me, even when I don't want them to, until I can find a way out. This time I was so scared that I would not let him say much. I thought he said, you missed it, as in the bus, but you can see the bus stop from down the road where I started walking from, so I knew I hadn't missed it. I said, no, 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 no ride, no ride, no. And he kept saying, babe, or hey, over and over. But once he saw my phone lit up, he drove away. I hung up because the adrenaline was insane, and I needed to calm down. I had not actually talked to anyone. They called me back to make sure I was okay. I filled them in and told them I thought the guy was gone. He never did come back that I know of. Thankfully, the bus didn't run late that morning, and I made it safely to work. From that day on, I tried wearing clothes that didn't accent my curves. Once I got a car, I haven't looked back at public transportation or long walks in the dark. I moved to a new town around two weeks ago. It is around four hours away from where I lived previously. I only knew two people who lived in this town, literally. I know no one. The two people are a couple who lived next door to me and my mom. On Friday, I received a message saying hi. I did not reply to it. It was from a number I did not recognize, and I am really not good with texting people back, so like I said, I did not reply. On Sunday, I received another message. I did not actually check my phone until Monday. Like I said, I am awful with it, and most of the time, it lives in the bottom of my bag. This one said, I see you and they had taken a picture of me walking down the street carrying shopping bags with my mom. They then sent another message saying, I also saw you here too. This was a picture of me in a pub with the couple I know. After that I was creeped out obviously, so I sent them a message saying, Who is this? It can't be the couple as they sat right next to me in the picture and the photo had been taken from far away. Around 10 minutes later, I got a message from this person. They had taken another picture of me, but this time it was while I was eating food with the girl of the couple I know, and it said, Did you enjoy your burger? This time I said, Who the fuck is this? This is creeping me out. Tell me who you are. They read my message, but have not replied to it. I have phoned the number, and all I hear when I phone is a man breathing heavily. I think... I literally do not know what to do. Should I be scared? I have no idea how they got my number. What do I do? Do I go to the police and show them the creepy pictures? So this happened in 2000, when I was like 13 or 14. But my aunt only told me the full story recently, and it's absolutely terrifying. When I was a teenager, my favorite aunt used to pick me up after school to babysit her three boys while she went to work part-time. 
She'd recently separated from her husband, so I was helping out pretty much every day at this point. We had a routine. We'd eat dinner and play in the yard until the sun went down. But one day she told me not to take the boys out at all. She then launched into this whole safety lecture, and I thought it was weird. Fast forward about a week and I come over one day to a security company installing an alarm system in the house. My aunt tells me to come in the kitchen. She tells me that for weeks she's been finding cigarette butts and food wrappers in the bushes. And that she heard a cough in the bushes, so she went outside to investigate. She found a guy squatting there, face pressed against the window, and proceeded to lose her shit. He snarled at her and said, Bitch, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking for that pretty babysitter of yours. Before running off, she called the police, but they didn't catch him and kept patrolling the neighborhood for a while after. Eventually, she calmed down and things returned to normal. We were allowed to play in the yard again after a few weeks and I forgot all about it. Last week, the story came up at a family barbecue and my aunt got really quiet and pale. She said that there was more to the story, and since I'm 30 now, I should probably hear the rest. It turns out, a guy matching the description she had given the cops was arrested about a week later for assaulting a teenage girl in an apartment complex one block from her house. It's terrifying to think this piece of shit excuse for a human had been watching me for who knows how long, and what he was planning to do, and what he did to someone else. At the time of my story, my friend and I were 28 and both of us under 130 pounds. We had done a lot of hiking together, but we hadn't ever been camping together, so we decided to camp at a popular location in western Oregon in early May. We choose a large campground, one that comprises of two to three separate loops, each loop with 25 plus campsites. By the time we got there, we realized that the park was empty, although a bit creeped out by the emptiness, we decided to make a camp. We choose a prime spot, the campsite was located down a flight of stairs, so our car was above us. We are both avid hikers and spend the day hiking at the foothills of the Cascades and around the nearby lake. This is a general store for the campground, somewhat near the lake, and we were surprised that not only was it open, but there were a few people in it. Two of those people were guys in their early 20s who had a case of beer with them and they were very interested in us but only leered. Nobody said hello. Both of us got the creeps from them. Nightfall at the campsite we had a fire going, a great campsite set up, but we were very aware of how alone we were out there. Around 10, 30, 11 we hear a very loud truck off in the distance. Within 10 minutes, we hear the truck driving around the loop. Mind you, there are no other campers in our loop. The trucks slow down past our car, then zooms off. We kicked around the idea that it was a ranger, but a ranger would call out to us. We both knew it was the two guys from earlier. My gut told me to get out of there and do it fast. So we started scrambling to take apart our campsite, practically running up and down the flight of stairs, unable to see the road. We are both at the campsite, and we hear that damn truck in the distance again. Ten minutes or so later, we hear the truck driving along the loop. This time, the truck doesn't just slow down. It stops by our car. I grab an axe, she grabs the beer spray, and we wait. Adrenaline is a funny thing. We were both prepared to fight since there was nowhere to run. So at that very moment, I wasn't scared. Then the truck sped off. Fear set in and we were shoving what was left of our camp into the car, literally just stuffing the tent in the back. When we were getting in the car to go, we hear the truck again. We sped off ourselves. There's no way the people in the truck had good intentions. At the very least, they were just trying to scare us. I believe the two guys were getting drunk and thought it would be a good idea to find two girls they saw at the lake. I don't think they wanted to ask our permission to party. From then on out, I've made very different decisions when it comes to camping and hiking. This happened last summer. 
I was playing video games when my mom asked me to come down the stairs. It was the late afternoon and since she was cooking dinner, she asked me to take something to the mailbox. So I did just that. I put on my shoes and went outside, letter in hand, not taking my phone or anything with me. I crossed the street and made my way to the four-way intersection at the end of our block. Crossed to where the mailbox is, that's when I noticed him. There was a man in the car on the other side of the intersecting street I was about to cross. He looked about mid-sixties in age, white, bald, and terrifying. He just sat there staring at me in his black SUV. I could sense something was wrong. I've never gotten that feeling before. He was on the left side of the street, his car right next to the curb. In an instant, I knew what was going on. For some reason, that didn't stop me from trying to cross the street anyway. I crossed the street intersecting ours to the mailbox and heard him slowly make a left turn and saw him pull up right behind me. I swore under my breath and knew he was trying to kidnap me. I was afraid he would get out of his car and as quickly as I could, I put the letter in the mailbox and ran back across the street. I made it back to my street and noticed he was gone. There is rarely crime where I live and honestly it still scares me to this day. I don't know why he was just sitting there, other than maybe he was a kidnapper. That night, my parents were going to be out, and so I was home alone. It had just gotten dark when I hear the doorbell ring. I don't think I had ever been so scared in my life. After about a minute, I peeked my head into the hall, and it looked like my parents' car was out front, and so I assumed that maybe they had gotten locked out of the house and answered the door. A lady stood there that I had never seen before. She told me she lived down the street and was out driving earlier when she had seen me near the mailbox and the old guy following me. She pulled right up behind him, sitting on his bumper. She knew what was going on. She had come to my house to tell me she saw exactly what happened and that she was close if I ever needed anything. To this day it terrifies me, thinking about the fact that if she hadn't been outside driving at the exact time, I might be in a completely different place now. Later that year, I heard reports of a kidnapper a few blocks away from where mine was. Nothing has been reported on my local news about it, so I can only hope he's gone now. This happened about two years ago when I was at a music festival in Norway. The festival had a full lineup of black metal bands playing so I was excited to be there. My friends had paid for my ticket which included a VIP pass for every meet and greet that was being held before any of the shows started. Of course I couldn't pass this up. My favorite band was headlining the entire festival. I can't quite recall what the name of the band was. The events of that festival are a bit fuzzy. Anyways, what happened on the last day of the festival will haunt me for the rest of my life. And if you were to see me, you'd think I was a lot younger than that. As a matter of fact, even though I was 20 years old, people thought I was around 12 years old. When I had gone into the festival for the first string of shows, security would frequently stop me and ask to see my ID since I looked underage. I'd even encounter a few people that would ask me where my parents were and then just walk away when I told them that my parents had passed away a year prior to the festival. My friends had left me to roam around on my own knowing that I didn't know the area very well. They all came with me just to see a few bands that were more popular than most of the ones that I wanted to see. I probably should have gotten one of them to stay with me since people around these festivals were typically total creeps and loved to perv on young guys and girls, but 
being the naive young black metal fan that I was, a lot of people that go to these festivals will tell you that if an artist notices something happening that shouldn't, someone is probably going to get stabbed because a lot of them are actually crazy. It was around midnight when the last concert ended and my friends were nowhere in sight. I found this a bit irritating because we were supposed to meet back in the entrance so that we could all go to the hotel together. When I was getting ready to start my five minute journey to the hotel, a woman I had never seen at this festival ran up to me. Hey, you going back to town? She asked me, the tone of her voice a bit shaky, like she had been crying for a couple of hours. Yeah, why? I'm trying to get back to my hotel so I can find out where my friends are. I told her, still visibly irritated, that my friends had left me alone. Almost instantly, this woman grabbed onto my arm, begging me to walk back to town with her. I pulled my arm free from her grip, now extremely pissed off that this woman was trying to follow me around. What the hell are you doing? I don't have time for you grabbing onto me. I have to get back to my hotel, I told her, making sure that she could tell that I was not happy at all. Can I stay with you tonight? My boyfriend won't take me home and I can't find him anywhere. She started begging. I was already fed up with her harassing me, so I just started walking away. For some reason, though, she started to follow me and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get her away from me. No matter how many times she started begging to spend the night with me, I ignored every one of her attempts to get my attention. Now I should mention that I am a big guy. Not as big as I look, like a whale, but big as in I could easily pick this girl up and throw her clear across a lake. I managed to get to the hotel and could see one of my friends standing outside the door smoking a cigarette. He looked surprised that I was just now showing up. Dude, I thought you were already here. I tried calling you a few minutes ago to get you to come down and to have a smoke with me. Where have you been? He asked me oblivious to the girl that had now stopped dead in her tracks a few feet away. I was waiting at the gates to the festival for you guys to meet me there. My phone didn't ring at all, I responded, pulling my phone out of my pocket and checking it for missed calls. Instead of finding missed calls, I found about 60 text messages from an unknown number. The intensity of these text messages were ranging, the intensity of these text messages were ranging from things like, do you want to hang out with me, to... I can see you, you look better when you are awake. At this point, I was beyond scared. Who was this person that sent these messages? Even though I knew answering the messages was a bad idea, I still responded to the very last message with, Who the fuck is this and how did you get my number? There was no response which made this even creepier. I came to the conclusion that I was just being paranoid and went inside to take a shower and get some sleep before tomorrow's final string of concerts. There was something that caught my eye though. The door to my hotel room had been busted open. Was there someone in my room? As I walked in, I called out to anyone that might be inside. Hello, is someone in here? I can see you busted the door open. I made my presence known to whoever could have possibly been in my room. Thinking nothing more of it, I took my time getting in the shower and going to bed to make sure that some kind of masked murderer wasn't in there. When I lay down at around 3 a.m., I heard something shuffling around in the closet. Hearing noises at 3 a.m. and having dealt with some creepy girl on my way back from the music festival was complete nightmare fuel. I hid under the blankets hoping that whatever was shuffling around would go away. I know you are not sleeping. I saw you hide under your covers, little boy. A very feminine voice whispered to me, Shit, 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 shit! Someone was in my room, just waiting for me to acknowledge them. I shot up and grabbed the lamp from the nightstand and turned on the overhead lights. Whatever was in the closet was going to get the beating of a lifetime. I grabbed my phone, dialing the number for the local police station, and had the lamp ready to hit whatever was in the closet watching me. As I opened the door, I could hear dispatch asking if everything was alright, and that's when the same girl from earlier came rushing out of the closet, pocket knife in hand trying to kill me. Knowing that dispatch could hear the struggle, I started screaming out for help. The police were there in what seemed like seconds and had the girl handcuffed in the back of a squad car. They took my statement and told me that I would be contacted by tomorrow night for further questioning about the incident. Who knows what would have happened if I didn't call the cops when I did. One thing still bothers me though. How did she manage to get past my friend and I 
when we were standing out front and there was no other access door to go through. Whatever, it doesn't matter now. She's going to jail for a long while and I can finally sleep. So to the obviously disturbed girl that followed me to the hotel, I hope you rot in prison. It was around midnight on Halloween when all of this happened. My cousin was living with my parents and I and had made friends at the local high school since she had been here. Well, she got invited to go run around one of those rich neighborhoods with her friends but had to drag me along with her since my mom said it wouldn't be fair if she got to have fun and I did not. Of course, she wasn't happy about this. Now I should mention that I was around 12 years old at the time and I looked like I was about 16. After having to deal with me for a while, my cousin decided to run off with some guy that she had just met to do God knows what behind someone's house. Since her friends all ran off somewhere else, I was left in the middle of a strange place, unable to defend myself from any possible attackers. Knowing that my parents would be extremely pissed off, I called my mom and told her that my cousin abandoned me to hook up with some random guy. Like I said before, my mom was pissed. She did what? Stay right there. I'll be there in an hour to come and get you, my mom told me. I was already crying at this point and begged my mom to hurry up. After hanging up the phone, I noticed that I was standing in a spot that was poorly lit and moved just a few feet away to stand under one of the street lights. About five minutes later, my cousin still hadn't come back. It was probably best that she did not. I noticed this guy in a Freddy Krueger costume staring at me just a few feet away. He walked over to where I was, flashing his fake glove at me like he was actually Freddy. I got extremely nervous and pulled my phone back out of my bag and looked down at it, getting ready to text one of my friends that was in the neighborhood. Are you lost, little girl? Do you want to come inside my house to stay warm? The guy asked me. No thanks, my mom will be here any minute to pick me up. I'll be fine, I responded, still looking at my phone, trying not to make eye contact with the guy. Come on, you can call your mom and tell her my address so that she knows where to go. I promise I won't hurt you. I've got a scary movie on at the house. He started trying to entice me to go with him. I said no. Now leave me alone. My mom will be here soon, I told him. Trying to show that I wasn't interested, the guy kept insisting and just wouldn't stop bothering me, so I started to go towards the entrance of the neighborhood to meet my mom there. For some reason, though, this guy kept following me. Almost immediately, my mom noticed me walking towards her car that was coming through the entrance and stopped. I opened the door and slid into the front seat, slamming the door so that the guy couldn't interact with me anymore. We couldn't find my cousin at all after driving around the neighborhood for what seemed like forever. So we left her there, knowing that she would call us whenever she wanted to come home. So creepy guy that was dressed like Freddy Krueger on Halloween, stay the hell away from me and get bent. I was 13 at the time and of course puberty hit me like a ton of bricks. This happened during the last day of school, my freshman year of high school. Unfortunately, I had gotten my monthly visitor during my math class and had to call my mom to pick me up seeing as I was too embarrassed to continue with my classes. My mom came and picked me up and brought a complete change of clothes for me so that I could alleviate some of the embarrassment. Once I had changed and followed my mother out to her brand new Chevy Tahoe, she asked me if I wanted to just go and have a girl's day since I had to suffer the embarrassment that I did. Before I even had the chance to answer, she drove straight to my favorite restaurant so that we could get lunch. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyways, my mom let me order anything I wanted and then took me shopping for new clothes to replace what had been ruined. And just so I could get some more expensive stuff along with the new clothes, it was a known fact in my family that 
I was an avid gamer and the latest installment of my favorite game had just hit the stores. When I saw the posters for it, I begged my mom to buy it for me, citing what had happened in school as a reason for her to get it for me. Of course, being her favorite and only daughter, my mother caved and spent the $80 for the deluxe edition that came with downloadable content and the collectibles. I was over the moon and couldn't wait to play it. Knowing that I didn't want to leave the game store just yet, my mom told me that she was going to go to the lingerie shop on the first floor and to meet her in the food court when I was done. Before she walked off, my mom slipped me a wad of cash totaling about $500 and told me and told me that the PlayStation had mysteriously shorted out and caught on fire while I was at school and told me to buy a new one. Great, broken PlayStation at home, but at least I get an instant replacement. I was crouched down looking at the newest line of PlayStation consoles that were on the shelves and picked up the one terabyte storage PlayStation Pro along with a couple more games and an external drive that had an additional four terabytes on it. When I took everything up to the cashier, I noticed this guy staring at me. He was about six foot seven and was really scrawny, but the way he was staring at me made me uncomfortable. It was like he wanted to cut me up and eat my flesh for dinner. Being 13, I could only assume the worst was going to happen if I didn't at least pretend to be on the phone. I paid for my gaming materials and that only came out to be maybe $250 since the consoles, games, and external drives were half off. As I was walking out of the game store, I could hear heavy footfall behind me. Was the guy from the game store following me? Hey, pretty girl. Want to come home with me? I've got a lot more games than you could ever want. A raspy, seemingly breathless voice said behind me. I kept my head turned. No thanks, I have to go find my mother, I responded, trying to pick up the pace so that I could get away from this guy. Oh, I know where she's at. I can walk you there. Come on, just give me a little time with you. The man behind me kept insisting. I said no. Now leave me the fuck alone, you creep, I spat hoping that a bit of hostility would get him to go away. Sadly, I was wrong. It just made him extremely angry to be rejected. He quickly caught up to me and grabbed my arm, yanking it as hard as he could. I remember when my mom had told me to start screaming in a crowded place if someone grabbed me and tried to take me away. Help! Fire! I screamed at the top of my lungs, catching the attention of several larger, more muscular men that had their children with them. Almost immediately after I had started screaming, the men that had actually looked came to my rescue. One of them subdued the guy and told me to find whoever I was supposed to be with and go to the guest services to talk to security. The second guy started asking me what had happened and where my parents were. I told him that my mom was down at the food court waiting for me and he demanded that he walk me there so that nothing else would happen. It was obvious that I could trust this guy since he had three daughters, one of them around my age. When I got to the food court, my mom had this look of fear on her face. That look was how, that look was how I knew that she had heard the screaming. Did you hear someone scream fire? My mom asked. Yeah, that was me. Some guy tried to kidnap me from the game store on my way down to meet you here. I responded. My mom thanked the man that was acting as a personal bodyguard and even tried to pay him, but he declined, telling her that he had three daughters of his own and knew that if the same thing had happened to his girls, that he would expect the same from some kind-hearted people, and even told my mom to pay it forward whenever she could. To the men that saved my life from the dangerous stalker that loved to prey on young girls, thank you. There should be more people like you in this world. So creepy guy that tried to take me away from the game store, go to hell. You belong there. So it happened quite a few years ago, maybe around 2013 or 2014. That's when I changed my entire style. 
I started wearing t-shirts with shorts and slightly more makeup. Natural skater kind of look. So I was at the mall with my mom and she wanted to check out this one clothes shop. It wasn't really my taste so I asked her if I could go get some bubble tea. She gave me some money and I went all the way down to the first floor from the third floor. Everything was okay so far. There were families around little kids occasionally looking at me because of my skin tone but I don't mind. I went to go get some bubble tea for my mom and I and slowly heading back up to the third floor where my mom was at. When I was almost at the shop, these three guys said, how are you? In the most laziest and effortless English ever then proceeded to laugh at me. I ignored them because I didn't know who they were and I thought that they were just bullying me because I'm a different skin tone. Then I heard them say amongst themselves and their own language uh she's rude never even say hi back what kind of people is this i kept walking to the shop then i noticed the three guys were following me i got paranoid and decided to walk around the floor basically one round around the floor before heading back to the shop then i noticed they were following me all the way so i started running into the shop as quick as possible i told my mom there were three guys stalking me and she told me to stop overreacting and that I was just paranoid. I couldn't stop shaking because I was scared. I looked out the shop and saw three guys standing outside the shop looking into it. I decided to hide deeper inside so they couldn't see me. Once my mom was done, she and I walked out and she asked me where the guys were and I told her that they were standing behind us. Then she told me that they were not doing anything and I should stop overreacting. When they saw I was with my mom, they stopped stalking me and started minding their own business. I am a 21 year old senior in college living with three other girls in an old one story house. We are located about a 15 minute walk from the main campus and the majority of our neighbors are college students. That being said, this town is notorious for being a little well known. That being said, this town is notorious for being well sketchy. Millie is home to one of the first insane asylums built in America. After the majority of it being closed down, abandoned for years, the final building was shut down about a month ago and the remaining patients were released. Now I doubt this is directly correlated with my creepy experience, but I am not the only one who has interesting encounters with strangers since the release of this town. Two nights ago after getting off of work around 11.30, I came home to my roommates getting ready to go for a night out. I realize now how stupid it was, but we often had an open door policy, free for anyone to come over and, and visit as they please. We would lock the door at night, but the one time we forgot really came to bite us in the ass. Around midnight I was hopping in the shower as my roommates were headed out the door. We said our goodbyes. I would be meeting up with them later. I had just stepped out of the shower when I heard what sounded like the front door slamming shut. I automatically assumed one of the girls had forgotten something, so I called out their names. No response. I then hear footsteps in the hallway. I call again. No response. Fear and dread came over me, and I immediately grabbed my clothes and ran into the bathroom. I threw my clothes on, leaned my ear to the door, and waited in silence to hear if someone was in the house. I hear nothing. I decided it must have been one of my roommates grabbing something and leaving again. So I head into the living room to get my phone. Six missed calls and it's still ringing. My roommate Carrie was on the other end. I answered and immediately could hear the panic in her voice. Lee, are you in the house? Yes, why? You need to get out of there. Sam drove by and said he saw a man walking through the front door. He called the police, but you need to leave. I shit my pants. Nothing was going through my head besides pure adrenaline and fear. I was not sure of the man's intentions, but I sure wasn't going to wait to find out. While remaining on the phone with my roommate, I bolted 
I bolted out the front door and hid behind my car. I watched the house from afar, waiting anxiously to see any movement. As my friends approached in a truck, I sprinted, I sprinted out from behind my car and jumped into the back of their truck bed. Just as I did, a dark figure scurried into the woods running in the opposite direction. I can only assume he had... I can only assume he was inching closer to me as I was waiting for them to arrive. I screamed, bloody murder, and we floored it out of there. I refused to go back into the house until the police arrived and it had been triple checked. There were no signs of anything being touched or stolen. Which makes me wonder what the man's intentions were. You can guarantee that I have locked the door every night since. And to the stranger who walked into my house while I was in the shower, let's not meet. This just happened to me a few nights ago, and I am still shaken up, so bear with me. I am a female bartender at a small cafe that doubles as the venue. During the day, we serve coffee and lunch, and at night, we have a full bar with bands, comedy shows, etc. On this night, there was an open mic comedy show. Not a lot of comedians showed up, so we ended up closing up shop early and I was ready to go home. I had a patron come in and order a single beer during the comedy show. He was acting nervous, but being a female bartender, I get male customers that are shy or don't want to talk to women, so I didn't think much about it. He sat there, sipped his beer, and watched the show. Since we closed early, everyone was pretty much gone, and I wanted to lock up and clean so I could get home. After I escorted the last couple, of the bar and got ready to lock the door. I see the man from earlier walk down the back hallway into the men's bathroom. Not even a minute later he burst through the door yelling, hurry, come back here, I need help. I stood there at the opposite end of the hallway and asked him what was wrong. The toilet is overflowing, there's water all over the floor, help me, help me clean this up. I could tell something was wrong and I replied, it's okay man, it happens. I'll mop it up. I'm just trying to close up right now. He continued to argue with me, trying to get me to come into the bathroom with him as I stood about 20 feet away down the hallway. Finally, he walks towards me very aggressively and tries to grab my arm. You need to come back here now, he says. I immediately pull my hands in front of me so he could not come any closer and I tell him he has to leave. He walks outside and I locked the door behind him. I checked the bathroom and it is completely spotless. No water on the floor at all. I flushed the toilet and urinal and they are both working fine. I start to get nervous and I take my large pocket knife and clip it to the wristband of my pants just in case. As I am cleaning our espresso machine and putting toppers on the liquor bottles, I hear a tapping noise. I look up at the front of the store, which is one big window that has a few curtains covering it. The same man is tapping on the window, waving at me, laughing like a maniac. I watch him walk over to the door and pull on it. It doesn't open since I had locked it. After he left, he starts screaming and pounding on the glass, saying, Open the fucking door! I'm going to fucking kill you! And I walked around the counter. And about six feet from the door, I pulled out my knife and locked eyes with him and yelled, I'm calling the cops. Get the fuck out of here. He smiled and walked out of view of the window. At this point, all of my adrenaline just crashed. I locked myself in the office and called 911, crying that I'm alone and a man tried to lure me into the bathroom and was outside trying to get into my bar. I waited an hour and a half. No police showed up. I called my boyfriend and he drove up to the shop. My manager watched the security cameras from home, making sure that the man didn't come back. I did the deposit and immediately drove home. My boyfriend, my boyfriend following close behind, my male bus boy has been coming in to work with me so I'm not alone and the managers have been keeping an eye on the security cameras while I'm working. So crazy dude who tried to lure me into the bathroom to do God knows what to me? Let's not meet again.
This happened on a nice spring day back in 2013. I was about 17 years old at the time and, and had skipped school. I was just laying in bed doing whatever I used to do on my laptop when my younger brother knocked on my bedroom window saying that there was a man in our backyard. It was still early in the day and still light outside so initially I wasn't very worried. Our neighbors consisted of old people and families with kids. I went upstairs and met with my brother in the living room who told me that the man was still outside in our yard with his beagle puppy. I peeked through the blinds on our floor to ceiling windows and surely there he was walking with his puppy on a leash. He looked like an average suburban dad out for a walk with his dog except his eyes were lost almost like he was dead inside. I stood there watching for a little while until I, until I see him walking slowly towards the house and up the stairs to where the back entrance. He was now on the porch just meters from where I was standing, hiding out of sight indoors. He slowly walked to the door, looked through the window and then proceeded to walk back down into the yard. At this point, me and my brother were starting to get scared. When some minutes had passed, I gathered my courage and went outside to ask him what he was doing. At this point, I should mention, my eight-year-old sister had just gotten her second batch of rabbits, tiny baby rabbits that she loved more than anything. I say second batch because the first two vanished one day. Leaving the door to the outdoor cage open, we figured that some neighborhood kids went to visit the rabbits and left the door unhinged thus the rabbits escaping. We later found him, missing several body parts, in head, lying on our neighbor basement stairs. I opened the door, adrenaline pumping, and asked calmly if the man needed some help and what he was doing in our backyard. He calmly explained that he was just training his puppy and that it was a bird and rabbit hunting dog. As confused as I was, I stared at him and didn't say anything in response. This is when I see his dog stepping proudly from behind the tree with one of our baby rabbits just hanging dead from its mouth. I did not expect this and I had no idea how to react to this so I just said okay and hurried inside to tell my brother. When I got in he told me to call our dad and he immediately called our neighbors to come and help us. We waited inside for a good 10 minutes keeping our eyes on the man as he calmly walked around in our yard with his dog and the rabbit. When our neighbor finally comes, he tries to escape through the back entrance. Our neighbors chase him around the neighborhood for a little while until finally catching him. The police were called and we found out that he had been training his dog all around the area for a couple of weeks and a lot of rabbits were missing. He was finally force submitted into a psychiatric ward by his ex-wife after some weeks. He got out after about a year or so and my mom sees him around quite often. So yeah, strange rabbit man, let's not meet ever again. I am a quiet loner and like to go on walks just to get some me time. This one night on the 27th of November. I decided to go on another lengthy walk of mine. There was something eerie this time though, as I had a feeling that the 27th of November is a night that something grotesque was going to happen, and boy was I right. So at around 2 a.m., I was restless and made my way into the cold night with that same feeling of dread I had earlier on in the day. The first hour, of my walk was pretty normal and nothing out of the ordinary, but lo and behold, I had a feeling I was being watched, bearing in mind that it was about 3 a.m. now, and I was sitting on a bench that was in a park that wasn't very well lit. Someone else being in the park was very unlikely, as it's a small town and the only people who would be around at this time are drunk pissheads. There was no sound coming from the dark figure that caught my eye. He was just standing there, staring in my direction. I looked down at my phone to put my touch light on and pointed my light towards the dark figure, but to my surprise, he had vanished. 
me just being paranoid and extremely tired, I just ignored the weird encounter and decided it would be best to make my way home and get some shut eye. Placing my phone back in my pocket and lighting up another cigarette, I made my way back to my house but still had this uneasy feeling of someone watching me. I am normally not easily scared but this felt different, like someone had decided to taunt me. I looked behind me to see the same dark figured man standing right beside a tree just looking my way. Now I know this isn't just something my mind had made up. I shout to the figure, hey man, is there a problem? You could tell there was fear in my voice, but I wasn't going to let this creep get the best of me. No response from him. Hmm. This was just getting weird now. I stood there with my eyes widened. The man got to the floor and started crawling towards me in a manner I could only describe as insane. The only thing I could hear was this hissing noise which I presumed was coming from him. I just stood there wondering what on earth he was going to do to me. But in my current state, I just looked at him with fear. As he edged closer, I vaguely noticed something was dangling from his rucksack. I guessed that it was some sort of bird or some sort of small creature. Anyway, I did not want to hang around to find out so I dashed up a small lane right behind to my house. Looking back on the ordeal, maybe I should not have headed straight back to my house as he would know where I lived, but my head was in a messed up place from all the fear this man had caused me. I ran through my gate to my front door and quickly glanced behind me to find him just standing outside my closed gate. One thing the man said to me will always send chills down my spine to this day. He muttered the words, One day we will meet again and this time you'll be coming home with me. The events of this night stopped me from going on walks because I still, even to this day, five years later, fear that he will come back and take me to some sinister place where he could do whatever the hell he wants to to me. So creepy man from the park, let's not meet again. This happened a few weeks ago when I was returning home from a bar. It was about 3 in the morning and I was a bit lightheaded from drinking too much. My friends had all gone home or went off with guys we met bar hopping. So I was all by myself with the expectation of the other party goers waiting to go home. It was the usual ensemble of crying girls, sleeping guys, and couples hooking up. The bus only runs every half hour or so at this time of night, so I was dozing when an obviously drunk male sat down next to me. He was in his late twenties, at least double my size, and had vomit on his chest. Something about him immediately caught my attention. Despite the fact that he had every right to be there, I sensed that he had chosen to sit beside me deliberately and not only because of the alluring bench, neither of us said anything to each other. However, I soon went back to being half asleep. The alcohol was affecting me more and more and I had almost forgotten all about him by the time the bus came around. It was only after I had stepped on the bus that it dawned on me that he was going in the same direction as me. Not only that, he chose to sit in the seat facing mine and was quite obviously observing me. Something about the way he watched me made me feel unsettled. He did not look for encouraging signs from me, but looked at me like we had known each other for quite some time and were traveling not as strangers, but companions. It is difficult to explain, but I got the feeling that in his mind we were already in an unsaid agreement of some sort. I tried to avoid looking at him for most of the journey, but gave in. This only served to encourage him and he attempted to speak to me, but I only answered in monosyllables and eventually stopped responding altogether. We were almost at the end of the route. When he stood to leave the bus, I sighed with relief, but my joy was short-lived. He stopped in the doorway and waited for a moment before he looked back at me. Are you coming? 
he asked in a tone you would use for people you know quite well, and not someone you have barely exchanged two words with. I ignored him, but he would not have it. Hey you, are you coming? He shouted. This is the last stop. I did not answer, and he went back inside the bus to sit beside me. He put his feet on the seat facing him, imprisoning me between him and the wall. The alcohol had dulled my senses to such an extent that I barely even realized the danger of my situation. The bus reached the last stop shortly thereafter, and the driver announced that everyone had to get off. I looked behind me to check for other passengers, only to discover that there was no one left but me and my unwanted admirer. Everyone else had already gotten off, and I had not noticed because I was too drunk. I have lived outside the city, so this is not exactly unusual, but I was alarmed at the thought of being alone with this drunk stranger in a poorly lit residential area. Alright, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead, like, share, subscribe. Thank you for watching.